It's been 20 years since I had a Les Paul, and I wanted one, so I got one. I was looking at the 2019, 20, and 21 Les Paul standards, now that they had the 50s and 60s models. And uh, I don't like the necks on the 60s, they're too small. I also don't like the Grover tuners that came with. So I was looking at 50s, and I uh, saw an awful lot of clown bursts out there with not very good figuring at prices that seemed a little bit higher than I wanted to spend. And I saw some really beautiful triple A grade that tended to be in the 27 to 2800 range, even before tax. And again, more than I wanted to or really could justify spending. And uh, I did some research and I found that the 2018 and 19 traditional are pretty much the same guitar. They have some minor differences in terms of the plastics and the electronics, but the core guitar is the same as the newer model. And um, this used to cost more new than even the AAA new ones do. And so the new model has driven the cost of these 2018s down. This guitar has no weight relief. It doesn't have the, the holes, either the Swiss cheese holes or the modern weight relief that they did. This is built like an actual Les Paul, though it doesn't have the long neck tendon and it doesn't have high glue. It doesn't cost anywhere near what those guitars that do cost. And uh, I got this for a very good price and certainly not worth the four, 500 more for it to be a brand new one or the almost $1,000 more to be a brand new AAA. I don't know whether this was considered a double A AA or AAA, but it's really pretty and it has the right feel to me. And I'm pretty close to dialing in the sound I'm after. So I'm very pleased with this guitar. And uh, I thought yeah, I'd give you some details on it because you're gonna be hearing uh, this through a lot of amps in the future. And I want you to know what you're gonna be hearing. Plus, we all like guitars, so here's a new one to play with. All right, let's start with the wood itself. You can see here it's got some nice flat sawn grain character. It's on both halves. Very nicely bookmatched uh, top. I think this is a double A, but it's, it's a groovy looking at certain angles as many triple A tops. And certainly not over the top, no pun intended. You can see that the grain disappears at certain angles and then comes back at others and comes back really strong. And uh, this uh, almost direct sunlight is kind of the worst case. That's a nice angle there, isn't it? Because uh, depending on how the light hits it right now, this looks almost very pale yellow or clear. Um, as the light gets darker, which I can emulate with this camera setting. Let's see here. As the light gets darker, that uh, ambers up and uh, it's not as sunshiny, sunrise, clown bursty. But then again, uh, many of the 60s originals were the tangerine bursts. Um, this finish is not ever going to look like a 58 or 59 because it had the aniline dye that fades. But if we're really lucky, this will age like a 60. Now, if uh, this were 20, 30 years ago, I'd go out and gig for six months in smoke-filled clubs, and all this nitro here would amber up and darken, and that would get that look that people pay lots and lots of money from the custom shop for. Not the full age stuff, the VOS stuff. Uh, it will still happen. It will just take a lot longer. But um, the color, which is right here, in a year might be the color that's right here, as that, does be, that nitro does begin to darken, at which point the binding will also begin to darken. It is very shiny and new. Um, I looked through the entire guitar as far as the finish goes. The only flaws that I see are fairly common ones. Let me get this set up. It's hard to do everything one-handed with this camera. 
And it's really minor nitpicky stuff. But uh, have you met guitarists? There's some bleed of the die onto the binding here and there. It's uh, a little bit more so in the neck pocket area. Not extreme, and the binding hasn't gone pink. You can see right here, let's see if I can get it to focus. You can see the maple cap there. Unlike the historics, which leave that maple cap uh, natural and only have the red dye on the mahogany body, this traditional from 2018, and from what I can tell, the current 60s and 50s standards from 19 through today have the same thing where you can see the maple cap there, but it gets the same finish as the body color. That's no big deal. Um, I got this guitar used and it has a couple of little bitty dings. I don't consider those finish flaws. Certainly nothing Gibson was responsible for. A couple of swirls on the back. Not much. According to the seller, this guitar was bought new, set up, and then kept in its case until I bought it. And uh, given the condition, I'm inclined to believe it. Now, maybe they didn't, whoever owned it never liked the weight. Maybe whoever owned it never bonded with a thicker neck. Uh, I don't mind the weight. And uh, I wish the neck were a little bit thicker, but so be it. These traditionals from 2018, and I suppose early 2019, have this textured plastic on the rear covers, unlike the solid plastic. And they've got black screws instead of chrome or nickel. That's plastic that's easily changed out. You can see some rubbing compound, buffing compound here. That's no big deal. When I got it, this was loose. and I, you know, I tightened all that up. No, nothing was damaged though. That's, uh, that's more on the shipper or whoever owned it before. Uh, not a not a flaw of the uh, guitars Gibson makes them or made them in this case. Uh, the 2018 traditionals have a larger uh, strap button than the old ones. The body is really pretty. It seems to be a two piece. You can see the seam right here. I've seen prettier, but this is absolutely fine, and I have no issues with the sound of the guitar. Let's look in the control cavity here. All right, 2018, they still had that metal plate. Uh, they don't, this one doesn't have all the push-pull nonsense and the dip switches that the classic, I'm sorry, the uh, standard from this year had, but traditional still had this metal mounting plate. And there's nothing really wrong with that. Um, I'm probably gonna take it out of mine just for weight, and I'm going to shield all this because this guitar would really benefit from some shielding. There's a, a myth that humbucking guitars don't need shielding. That's false. Humbuckers eliminate uh, 60 cycle noise. They don't, uh, are not immune to environmental noise. Now, the leads are shielded here from the pickup. But as soon as it gets to in here, where the shielding is not, there's only this partial shield from this metal plate and noise can get picked up right there and, and here on these unshielded wires, and it is. And it's uh, very noticeable in this guitar. I'm not crazy about the wire going from here to the pickup selector switch and then from there to the output jack either, but I do this for a living. That's easy for me to change. I did measure the pots. They are Gibson branded um, 500Ks. Some of them measure a little bit over 500K. They're audio taper. There's nothing wrong with them. I do find that they are a little bit stiff, uh, which is a, a, a little bit stiffer than I would like. That's always subjective. And uh, uh, the shafts, because they are set on this metal plate, um, let me show you on the other side. The knobs come almost all the way flush to the body because the pots and their shafts, let me turn off my meter, are so far down because on that pl that plate, if that plate were not there, these would get up off the body like they are on the originals. And I prefer both to have that little bit of space 
because it's easier to get your pinky on the edge when you're when you're rolling things up. And these just have a little too much resistance on that same note. I like these to turn easily, but not turn if you don't want it to. So if I set it to seven, I want it to stay at seven. I don't want it to just kind of slide around. But at the same time, if I want to go from seven to off, I want it really fast. And it's just each of them has quite a bit of resistance and a different amount of resistance. So I'm going to stick some Mojo Tones or RS pots in there. Um, the uh, knobs are also not the best looking I've ever seen. These numbers are just painted on. They're not embossed on the other side as far as I can tell. So, But again, that's cosmetic. Uh, before we move on, I guess I don't need to show anything else in the... In the oh yeah, yeah, I do. I need to go back to control cavity for a bit. All right. So they have the orange drops that they're making so much out of in terms of their marketing. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with an orange drop. You can see the tone circuit is connected to the input of each volume pot. I prefer it connected to the wiper. When I redo all this, that'll be the case. And this plate with the center post be going away and this will all be wired what I consider more properly. That said, there's nothing so wrong with this that someone cannot go out immediately and make good music with it. It's not holding you back from making good music. The pots are fine. Um, I don't like the, the physical resistance of them. They could be loosened. Other people will love that. So it's very subjective. But at the end of the day, this guitar is mine, and I have to like it. And I'm really close to that point. You know, a 10-pound guitar is not a problem for me to have over my shoulder for a three-hour gig. I've done it. I'm a big guy. It's not a big thing, but flipping it over one-handed without hurting the damn thing, that, that's, that's interesting. All right, as far as the pickups are, I measure them in circuit. When I pull all this stuff, I'll measure them out of circuit, but I'm sure that it's pretty close to what I'm, 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 I'm calculating. Uh, given that these are about 500, 510K uh, volume pots, this one uh, in the neck measured uh, 7.56, which means that it's probably about 7.68 K. And the bridge measured 8.16, which means it's probably closer to 8.3 K. So probably 8.3 K and 7.7 K, which are both slightly on the hotter side uh, for vintage PAFs, but not so much. Um, if someone said, hey, you've, you've got a Les Paul and you want it to sound like a 50, 59, or early 60, what pickups would you choose? I'd say, I'd, oh, Alnico 2. I might play around with short or, or long bar magnets, but Alnico 2, and I'd want 7.5 and, and 8. So these are just slightly more than, than that. Uh, the, the, I haven't said, have I? The Burst Bugger 1, Burst Bugger 2. Um, and that that's uh, very close to, this measure, uh, to the given spec for these. I think they say that they're 7.5K and 8K, but there's always variation. And uh, the variation between an 8.3K and an 8K, or a 7.7 and a 7.5 can just be pickup height, which can be adjusted. These screws are there for a reason, people. So, um, you know, uh, while I will change pickups in a heartbeat if I feel it's warranted, uh, from the past couple of days of playing this guitar, these Burst Buckers seem very promising. I think I like them. I certainly like them better than the Burst Bucker 61s. They're in that SG, which I found way too shrill and trebly. Uh, the difference, as far as I understand, between these Bur Burst Bucker 1 and 2s and the Burst Bucker 61s are these are Alnico 2, the 61s are Alnico 5, and um, both kinds of pickups are what they call scatter wound on the uh, Burst Bucker 1s and 2s the uh, uh, slug coil has more lines than the uh, uh, pulpius coil. And the Burst Bucker 61s, it's reversed. The uh, adjustable coil has more uh, lines than the slug coil. And on the, especially on that SG, where the bridge pickup is physically closer to the bridge, that resulted in a painfully bright sound for me. I changed those out for some overwound Alnico 2s. Um, uh, 8.6K, by the way, so just a little bit hotter than this, and I think they're going to be kind of similar. I'll show that, but this one at 8.3, a little bit farther 
away from the bridge and the 8.6K a little bit closer to the bridge. Probably similar places. Um, and again, 7.6, 7.7K here. And on the SG neck pickup, which is a full half inch farther from the neck, the, the straight 8K. Again, going for the same uh, dimensions. Uh, pretty much the same tonal goal, given the differences in body wood. Uh, let me get a sip of my drink and I'll continue. All right, talking Les Pauls, this thirsty work. All right, this has the same uh, ABR uh, bridge with the studs going into the body rather than just the post that the SG has, or had. I changed it on the SG. On the SG, I changed it to the Faber. Uh, not only because the bridge was locking, but because it had inserts which replaced uh, this system with just studs, really firmly mounted. But as you'll recall, my SG has a Maestro, and uh, that back and forth with this this style bridge rocking was not stable for tuning. Uh, so far, this bridge has been very stable. Um, you know, I don't have any issues with this bridge, and very crucially. Notice where the G is. Uh, when this guitar arrived, it was perfectly intonated for the setup that came with. And it came up with a good setup. It was just a little bit low for my tastes. And so I raised it and changed the relief a little bit. Uh, it was just a little too straight. And I like, I like an almost straight neck. I just needed a little more relief and I wanted a little more height so I could do some uh, major third bends, which a lot of people don't do. I like the ability to do that. And as a result, I've knocked the intonation out a little bit, but I still have room to adjust. And there's plenty of room on that G string saddle to adjust it without flipping the saddle over. On the SG, uh, with the stock bridge, with the Tone Pros, and with the Faber, I had to reverse this G saddle and move it all the way to the back to get it to intonate because they had mounted the entire bridge too close to the neck on that SG almost an eighth of an inch too, too, too close. So the bridge is located in a much better spot on this. And if anyone at Gibson is listening to these videos, check your CNC setup for the uh, SGs you're making. Because you're putting the bridge in just slightly the wrong spot and the uh, ABR can barely, barely intonate for it. This A saddle, I would prefer to have uh, flipped around. I might do that at some point. I didn't want to start making changes until I was sure I liked the guitar. The uh, tailpiece is aluminum, uh, like the old ones, um, and uh, it sounds fine. Uh, as far as the top wrapping goes, I'm not trying to start that argument. I'll leave that to the gear page as to whether it makes any difference whatsoever. For me, it absolutely does in one fundamental regard. And so I don't care about sustain or the uh, strings be more flexible. Uh, you can have a great sounding guitar top wrapped. You can have a great sounding guitar non top wrapped. I find that the top drop, top wrapped bridge on a, a Les Paul or 335 or stop bar SG is just much more comfortable for my palm. I don't have that extreme downward angle and this just piece of metal just randomly there. This is a nice big surface for my palm. It's smooth. I like it. It's my guitar, I'm doing it, and it looks cool. So, you know, if you want to argue about that, do it somewhere else. Now you'll notice that this tailpiece is at an angle. These screws are as low as they go. It's just that the gap in the Gibson uh, posts there, whatever you want to call that, is uh, a little bit wider than the height of this aluminum uh, piece, piece of aluminum on the tailpiece itself. As far as I know of the ones on the market, the Faber and the Callaham have that pretty much an exact fit. So if I did this on the Faber or the, or the Callaham, this tailpiece would not be at this angle. It would be uh, exactly perpendicular to the guitar. Uh, this angle does not affect anything in, in terms of playing as far as I can tell. And I don't think that alone is worth spending $200 for the Callahan or Faber full setup. Uh, the Faber bridge was certainly worth it on that SG with the bar, but 
here I think we're just going to be fine. Um, it's not my preference, and, and maybe maybe one day I'll get the favor and say I was wrong. This sounds so much better. But for right now, this is not stopping me from enjoying this guitar or uh, getting good sounds out of it. Uh, neither is the lack of uh, historically correct uh, pickup ring heights, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The knobs bother me, but that's very utilitarian as far as the, the distance from the body it makes it hard to, harder to grab, and the uh, the resistance. So that's seemingly cosmetic, but uh, it actually does affect how the guitar works when I play it. So let's move on to the neck. Uh, the binding on this guitar is really good. I've certainly seen worse on much more expensive Gibsons. It's got a little bit of a rollover on the edges. Not too much chatter or scrape marks on the fretboard as a result. A couple. It's not perfect, but not too bad. And, you know, the binding is never scraped perfectly on any Gibson ever, as far as I know, um, between the frets. But this is as good as many historics and custom shops and old nice ones I've seen. I have no problems with the binding. Uh, the frets are really nice. Um, they're calling them, in 2018, I don't know if they're still cl claiming this in the 2020-21s, they're saying they're cryogenically treated. Um, I don't know uh, whether they are or what, whether that makes any difference at all. You have to ask a metallurgist. I will say that they are, uh, there are no buzzy spots or no dead spots on any of the strings all the way up and down the neck. Um, as far as I can measure here, or the tools I have, I'm not seeing any measure, uh, higher low spots. Uh, I've gotten out a six inch ruler and a four inch ruler, and, and there's no rocking happening, and they feel very smooth, and they look fairly well polished. I know that uh, my buddy Bobby can get them even better if necessary, but I've seen uh, much worse from quote setup guitars. I suspect that whoever had this guitar before when they had it set up, that person did this because I've not seen a Gibson with shiny frets from the factory in a long, long time. Again, this is not an overview of the 2018 traditional as if you just bought one. This, you know, it's three years old and I'm not the first owner, um, but So if someone polishes the frets, this is po what's possible. Similarly, the rosewood's not all dried out. It's a little dry, and next time I change strings, I'll add some conditioner. But I didn't want to change anything on the guitar other than the strings while I evaluated it. It's not perfect. You can see a little bit there at that inlay. There's a little mark by that one. But, you know, it's a pretty piece of rosewood. It's not orange. It's, yeah, it's got that chocolate stripe thing. It's not Brazilian. It didn't cost what a Brazilian board would cost, and I know that it'll darken up nicely uh, when I condition it with the right oil. Let's see, the neck profile. It just says 50s rounded, and Gibson has done a lot of variations on what 50s rounded means. Um, and I don't have the proper calipers to go here and here when the strings are on. Next time I change strings, when I condition this, I'll take more accurate measurements. From what I'm able to estimate, though, I think it's about 0.84 at the first fret, and almost one, about 0.97 something at the 12th fret. So um, certainly not a boat anchor baseball bat like some R8s, R7s. Not quite as thick as a lot of uh, uh, R9s. Um, and certainly not as thick as many 60s. I'd say this is transitional neck. You might find a neck like this, uh, uh, and as far as Les Pauls, on some uh, 1960s that are relatively early in the year as the changes began to come in. Or if someone was just not quite paying attention while they're shaping the neck in 59. It's certainly got that nice heft up here uh, and the higher frets. And it, 
it just gets a little bit thinner than I'd prefer right here, but not by much. Uh, if, if, if I had the um, uh, neck fit profile at the fit at the first fret that I have at the fifth, I would call this just ideal. That would be my dream Les Paul if that was the, the thickness there. But then most people probably couldn't play it. I've got big hands. And this is, uh, you know, so about the same really at the first fret as my Eric Johnson Strat, which I really like. Um, it's certainly uh, much thicker throughout the entire neck than that 61 uh, SG I have. And I found that SG neck very comfortable. It's by far the smallest neck I have, but it, it, it's nice. It, and so much of it is not just the depth of any neck. People make so much about, of the measurement, the thickness measurement. It's about the, about the amount of shoulder and how the shoulder is shaped. And this is a very comfortable neck. I think if you like 50s necks, it's got that meat. If you uh, are concerned about a neck being too big, especially down here where you got more space between frets, you know, it, it does get smaller. I wouldn't call this tiny. And in fact, compared to the 90 classic or 92 classic I used to own, this thing is a baseball bat. Uh, I think it's going to be a lot of fun for a long time. It feels very comfortable in the hand. And uh, I like the, the feel of it. I've got, uh, you know, I'm expressing opinions. Uh, what gives my opinions any weight if they have any? Um, I'm very lucky to have grown up in Memphis, Tennessee, and to have hung out at the right guitar stores and vintage guitar stores in, in the 80s. And I have actually played a lot of, uh, uh, I'd say a lot of 60s Gibsons, and I've played quite a few late 50s Gibsons. You know, given uh, the nature of guitar stores and 16 year old boys who hang out in them, I was. I was more often allowed to try the SG Junior or the Special than I was to try the Les Paul. Even in 1987-86, the, the real bursts were uh, considered something special. But I have played a few. And my memory of them is that on the 59s, the first fret was much more like the third or fourth fret here. And I've played a lot of the reissues and you know, historic things. And I've got a friend who owns a bunch. And I find some of them to be much larger than any original I've ever played. Uh, some of the R8s and R7s are seemingly much bigger than any real 57, 58 Gibson, uh, Les Paul, or, or Junior, or Special I've ever encountered myself. And I'd love for someone to say, no, you're wrong here. Play this 1958 Les Paul, you'll see. <laughs> you know, please, please punish me with, uh, let me play some guitars worth more than my house. But um, I think too much is made of the whole thing on the internet. There's just too much mythology mixed in with the, the fact. Um, it comes down to uh, how you play, how you fret, what's comfortable to you, and to a certain degree, tone. Um, and it's not some esoteric thing. You know, the SG has got a thinner neck, much thinner neck than this. It has a nice profile. It's very comfortable. It has nice shoulders. That SG, between its neck thickness and the way the neck joint is done on the SG, so I play the low E string and bend one of these strings, this low E drops a lot, almost like on a Strat. This guitar, you can do double stop bends up top, and the E and A barely, barely drop. This is a much more stable neck, and that's a combination of the thickness and the neck joint, and, and that does affect the tonality. When the neck is stiff, it has a different resonance than when the neck is uh, a little bit flexible or prone to bending. Uh, let's see. If you're still watching this, I assume you like guitars as much as I do, because I really like guitars. All right, let's move down to the headstock. Um, I think this might be slightly, slightly like a few hundredths of an inches wider at the points than the headstock on my uh, 2020 SG standard. Um, other than that, it seems to be pretty much the same. It's got the exact same uh, fake loosens. We'll get to that. 
that the SG had. I changed them on the SG to some real close and uh, the locking revolutions and more on that in a little bit. It's got seemingly the same uh, logo. It might be a little bit closer to that uh, D string tuner on the 2018 than it is on the uh, on the uh, SG. But uh, I'm not having any issues with it. I, I think, you know, I've seen so many different headstock shapes and sizes from Gibson over the years. This is this is acceptable. Uh, I've got the truss rod co cover off because this guitar came to me from Pennsylvania. And they think it gets hot and humid in Pennsylvania, but it's August in Memphis. And uh, I gave it a tweak. And I know that this guitar will continue to acclimate over the coming weeks as uh, it really gets used to living here. So I expect I'll need to give this a few more tweaks. But the, uh, get the focus. I don't see any issues in the pocket. There's no damage to the wood. There's no cracks. There's no stress on the nut, the brass nut. It's got a little bit of glue or paint on it, which is common to these. I know eventually I'll take this to my friend Bobby and he will take this off and burnish it and clean it and put it back on with some white lithium grease because that's what he do. All right, this nut um, will get changed in the coming weeks. And um, I like this nut better than the stock nut on the um, SG. On the 2020 SG, the nut, there was a graph tech. Uh, pre-slotted thing that Gibson is doing now and uh, it was really ugly looking and all the slot all the strings were cut way too high you know uh, there was just way too much height here and the strings were kind of buried and I didn't like the behind the uh, witness point angle this bridge is some kind of nylon which is much closer to what they would have had in the 50s and it's cut much better. Um, the behind the string, the behind the witness point angles are much better. The, uh, the height is better. It's not quite as buried. Let's see if I can get a better shot of that. Still buried on the on the plain strings and a little bit here on the D. Uh, but it is also still just too high. And factory nuts are almost always cut too much too high. You know, not too bad on the D but the G strings moving way too much. There's just way too much daylight there. And uh, when the nut slots are too high, uh, these notes go sharp. And especially on a Gibson, you wanna play an E major chord. Let's see if I can do it with my right hand. It's weird to think about. That G, that third, gets painful when that's sharp at all. And it's always wants to be sharp anyway. So, you know, that if uh, if I had to, I would, get in here and I'd remove the strings and I'd file away the excess on top so the strings weren't buried and I'd lower the slots a little bit. But uh, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to take this to my friend Bobby and he'll put a nice bone nut on here and it'll all be perfect. Um, now, in the SG video where I mentioned things about the tuners not being great and the nut was too high and the frets weren't polished and the bridge wobbled and I didn't like the pickups. Um, negative comments on that, that video fell into two categories. Number one, what did you expect? You bought a new Gibson, you should have saved up more and bought a, a custom shop. And the other camp was, what kind of idiot are you to spend that much money on a guitar that has all these problems and stop crying about it and bob, you know, you know, Basically saying that I was naive either way. Well, let me tell you something. I'm, I'm 50. Um, I've been doing guitars and amps all my adult life. I, I know uh, probably more than is good for me about this stuff. When I buy a guitar, I'm buying the wood, an electric guitar specifically. I know that I can change the, the pickups. I know that I can change the hardware. I can do all the setup stuff. I want good wood. Uh, the rest is window dressing. And, um, you know, yes, I know I could spend quite a bit more and maybe get closer out of the gate, but you'd be surprised how, how much it costs to find a 
truly perfect Les Paul these days. I don't, you know, I, I have my, I've had some issues on very expensive custom shop historic Les Pauls that have come in. So I've not encountered that mythical perfect guitar if you just spend enough. I have encountered many guitars like this where if you get a good price, especially used, which I did, and you make intelligent choices about what you uh, change. Some of it's changing just because you want to change it. Some of it is an actual objective upgrade. Then, you know, as long as you're not spending money wildly or trying to sound, you know, in some chase to sound like someone you're never going to sound like. Yeah, just, I know what I'm doing. Uh, I know what changes I want to make. Um, and I know why. And uh, I factored the cost of the wood that is the guitar as it came to me into that. Uh, th this will be my eighth guitar right now. I've owned more, a lot more than that in my lifetime, but right now this will be number eight for me. And of those eight guitars, aside from the Squire uh, Precision Bass, where I've not changed the nut because it's not necessary, it's I'm not going to spend the money to get a bone nut put on that thing. It sounds fine the way it is with the plastic. Of all the other guitars I have, Fender, Gibson, um, Gibson Bozeman, Gibson Nashville, um, um, then stuff I've made, my parts casters from Musicraft. The only guitar in that entire list where I did not have to change the nut from day one was, it, of all things, an Eastman copy of a Martin D28. The stock nut on that Eastman was cut just about perfectly. The G string is ever, ever so slightly high, but that's, it's, it's, like a thousandth of an inch. It's just slightly off, and it's not even worth taking to have that worked on, because I know that over time, the pressure of that string will do a little bit of its work for me. So if I get a new Fender, if I get a new Gibson, I expect to have to change the nut. All right, these tuners that say Gibson Deluxe are the same tuners as the Pingworks that I had problems with on that SG. And on the SG, the tuners had two uh, areas of concern that made them problematic for me. Number one, there's a lot of slop in the tuner itself as you turned it either way. It would have very little change and a lot of change, very little change and a lot of change, and that was in the gearing itself. Number two, especially on the unwound strings, The, the holes in the in the uh, pegs were just a little bit too large and there'd be that flat span where it hit that hole and be a big gap for whatever reason i'm not having the same issues with these tuners as i did on the sg uh, it's probably exacerbated on the sg by the fact it has the maestro that said i still don't like these tuners because the posts come up so high I just don't like the look of it. I'm changing them out because it's my guitar and I want to like everything about that guitar. Now, I hate Grovers. I'm going with the Clusen style. I just don't like these really high posts on this. And I'm not a huge fan of this larger uh, washer look. And I think I've got a way around that, but that will be uh, a thing to be shown later. So I'm gonna change the tuners. I'm going to have an, a bone nut put on. I'm going to shield the control cavities, both of them. I'm going to do it right. I'm going to change the pots um, for some that have a little less resistance when I turn them. And the new pots will be, I'll be able to adjust the depth so that the knobs will sit just, just barely below the height of these po uh, pointers which makes it easier for me to grab them, I find. I'm going to live with this bridge and tailpiece until the point where I, I, I know that I can, there's some reason to change, but they seem to be fine and stable. I've not had any of the tuning issues with this bridge that I did with the uh, one on the uh, SG. I'm going to have my friend Bobby take a look at the, the slots in the, these saddles when he does the nut, because I'm sure that so the D wants to go a tiny bit sharp at times, and that can just be uh, the angle here and just 
dressing up that slide a little bit better can take care of that. And I think I might have a long-term happy relationship with these burst buckers. I still need to play around with the pickup height and to some degree the pole piece height and then the relation between the two. But I've got to play it through a couple of more amps to get a sense of uh, how it really sounds. And uh, as for playing this thing, you will hear this in many videos in the coming days and weeks and months. And you can hear it a little bit in the uh, Vox AC30 from 1965 that I put up yesterday. Now, it's interesting to me that right now at this angle that I'm at, it almost looks like a plane top. You can just see the hints of, of the figure. You can definitely see that flat song. And if I just move the camera a little bit, bam, it costs more money that way.